our first guest speaker today. Um, he has the look of somebody who's always had this health and wellness thing sorted, but that actually wasn't always the case with him. He's now very busy heading into the semi-final of The Voice of Ireland. Please welcome Brezzy. <laughs> How are you? It's not very often a man from Westmead gets into Crow Park, so I'm having a bit of crack here. Uh, I'm going to enjoy myself. I just want to set out a few things before I start. I'm not here to motivate you. Um, motivation is something that you've got to generate yourselves. Um, I want to talk about a journey that revolves around mental health. And in this country, we have this unbelievable ability to separate physical health and mental health like they're not the same thing. And they are. And we're here, we're talking about diet and food. And the fact is, the ability for diet and food to affect your mental health is profound. And we ignore it and we pretend it doesn't matter. And I'm going to get to that. But first, I want to give you a brief background of my story and how I ultimately had to kind of take back my own life and learn how to motivate myself properly and learn to get deeper, much deeper, because we throw the word motivation around way too much in this country. You know, you have some fella in a gym screaming at you. That's not motivation. That's someone screaming at you. That's just annoying. And you know, if you're going into a gym on a, on a Monday morning and some fella's spitting in your face, roaring at you, you just want to box him in the head. Because that's not your motivation, and we don't all respond to that. We respond to something a lot deeper, and that's what I want to get to, resilience. Um, as a 15-year-old, uh, I was achieving a lot. I was captain of my school football team. I was playing rugby at a high enough level, but privately I was in a very, very bad place. I was choking every night I went to bed. I'd be ripping my duvet apart trying to catch my breath. And I would do this every single night, I would just choke and choke and choke, and I couldn't sleep. I was a crippling insomniac at 15. I was going days and days, even weeks, without sleeping. My hair was falling out. My skin was ripped apart. And at the time, Google didn't I'm not that old, but Google didn't exist. So I kind of said to myself, what is this? And to give you a brief introduction, at the time, I didn't know what it was. It was generalized anxiety disorder. And the one worst thing that could be in a house for somebody with general, uh, generalized anxiety disorder, my mum had a book called the Encyclopedia of Health that she used to put in the coffee table in our sitting room. And I would go through that book every day, and I would have every disease in the sun. I'd have AIDS, I'd have cancer. I was even pregnant at one stage. <laughs> I just read this book. And I let these issues build up within me. I had a very great, uh, an amazing family, brilliant backgrounds. There was no reason for this panic that I had every evening. So this progressed throughout my teenage years to the point where I was having a panic attack nearly on a daily basis. I used to completely and utterly rip myself away from the social world. I didn't hang around with anyone. I used to run home through fields and on the railway track so I couldn't meet anybody. And it progressed and it progressed and it progressed to the point that I ended up fracturing my own arm to try and get help. I wanted to physicalize my mental problem. And I went into the doctor, into the hospital, the first and foremost said, your arm's bollocksed. And I said to him, I did that to myself. And he said, it's puberty. And when I was told that as a 16 year old, having gone through a year of hell, all sorts of bad things went through my head at that point. And this progressed throughout my teenage life. And the strange thing was I was still achieving because I was achieving in spite of it. At that early stage in my, uh, my relationship with mental health, I had discovered that I had to use something as a motivation. And my motivation was training. I would play two, three matches a week. I would train twice a day. And people thought I was just an energetic kid. I wasn't, I had to. It was a form of medication. Getting out on a pitch, only when I was on a pitch did I not feel that crippling anxiety. And 
just to give you a brief idea, because there's some people in this room who mightn't really know what anxiety feels like. And I know there's a lot of people in this room who know exactly what it feels like. But anxiety isn't stress. It's not stress. We've all felt anxiety before an exam, before a driving test, before something, getting married, you get that sick, and I'm not married, but if I was, that sickening, um, crippling nausea feeling in your stomach and that tension in your chest. Generalized anxiety disorder is that 24-7. It never goes away. The next corner you go around, you think you're going to be killed. It's full of dread, and that's a difficult thing to live with. It consumes you. And I was living with this every single day. And the only way I could treat it was to get out on a pitch. And I, I continued to, uh, to achieve at that level. And one of the things I, I recognized being in school, and when I was in school, and it's changing slightly now, but it's still not in the system, we always seem to put academic achievement, economics, and politics ahead of human development. And it makes no sense to me. We forget about humans. We forget about how humans work, why they work, what motivates them, and we just push it aside. Money's always more important, and politics will always be more important, and that is complete bullshit, and that's the way we run our society. So I went on, I went into university. I'll keep this brief. I got a scholarship to play rugby in UCD. I think I got a scholarship because I realized I could come up to Dublin and beat up posh Dublin school kids in rugby and get away with it. So I got quite good at rugby. Uh, my first day in UCD, I walked in to the arts block, which is the most disgusting building that was ever built in this country, the UCD arts block. And I opened the door, and about 600 people came out of a lecture theater. I didn't realize that much makeup existed in the world. Uh, I genuinely didn't. It was like Brown Thomas exploding. And I, here, just picture it. 18 stone, six foot six, shaved head, scars all over my face, and I ran downstairs and hid in the toilet for four hours and had a major panic attack. So within college, what started happening is I started experiencing crippling depression. And depression to the point where I wasn't able to get out of my bed, I wasn't able to function, I wasn't able to eat, I wasn't able to sleep. And another point on depression, and just bear with me this, because this becomes a lovely story. <laughs> but depression, it's hard to explain. And once again, I know there's a large handful of women in this room have experienced it. I know. Not because of statistics, because it's normal. It's completely normal. And everybody in this country goes through it, yet we're so ridiculously embarrassed about the stigma, which is, once again, bullshit. But I know there's a, a lot of people in this room who know exactly what I'm talking about. But I'm just going to give you, for those who don't fully understand, or maybe have a loved one, and, and kind of want to understand a little bit more about it, this is quite hard to say and probably hard to hear, but when you're going through an acute depressive episode, you have no emotional capabilities whatsoever. And somebody could come in and tell you a tragic story, or somebody could come in and say one of your loved ones or family members was killed in a car crash, and you couldn't feel anything. You couldn't feel empathy. And then what happens on that, you throw guilt on top of it, and you feel guilty, and you feel depressed, and it's difficult, difficult way to live. And I went through this throughout my college years. And by the time I, uh, I got through college and got my degree, I don't know how I got my degree, because the second day I went in after that panic attack, I took two Valium, uh, which is just not a sustainable thing to do. But I remember walking into the lecture theater, and I'm pretty sure I high-fived the, 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 the lecture. And I sat down, right? And I was sitting at the end of the, in the lecture theater, 600 people, and it was Freshers' Week. And I just looked up, and there was a fish, a massive fish, on the desk beside me with everybody in the, in the room screaming. And I looked at the fish going, that is strong Valium. <laughs> the, the woman beside me just turned into a salmon. And I realized some guy had thrown a fish into the lecture theater, you know, as a, as a prank. And everyone was screaming and running around. And I was completely chilled out. And everyone was like, that Brezzy fella is fairly cool, isn't he? Like, not knowing that I was completely stoned. And I knew I couldn't do that anymore. So what I did was I had to stop going to college. I had to defer my exams. Once again, my mental health issues were controlling my life, controlling my life all the time. I got a professional rugby contract. I don't know how I did, but I got a professional rugby contract when I, when I graduated from college. And I knew 
it wasn't going to work. And within the college setup, my first realization of how important food can be for your mental health was made. Because when you're in college, you automatically tend to eat crap. You tend to drink more alcohol than you normally would. You tend to have a little, your lifestyle changes for the worst in general. It's good crack, but it changes. And I realized when I let my immune system get run down in any capacity, if I let it kind of get low, it would have devastating effects on my mental health. I wouldn't be able to get out of bed. Some people, when they let their immune system get low, they get a chest infection or they get a cold. I get seriously depressed. And that was my first connection between how food can influence, how food and general lifestyle can influence your mental health. Because people going through these just believe nothing will help. And that's not right, because there's things you can do. And the first port of call, which I will get to in a few minutes, is how and what you're putting into your body. Because you think of this, if depression and mental health issues are caused by issues with hormones and issues with chemical imbalances, what point is it throwing in foods that upset it? Processed foods that just poison and put more chemicals into your body and, uh, and offset all these issues. So I made, luckily made that connection when I was in college. But I went on to play rugby. And it was great having a professional rugby contract. Everyone thinks, thought it was great, but I wasn't able to function as an athlete. My first, or my third cap for Leinster, on the Wednesday evening, before the game on the Friday, I found myself trying to knock myself out by headbutting a wall um, because I didn't feel I was going to be able to stand on a rugby pitch on Friday. And I was in my, in my apartment in campus with all the strength I had, headbutting a wall till I felt dizzy and nauseated. And I'm pretty sure I didn't knock myself out, but I was concussed, which doesn't mean a hell of a lot in rugby nowadays. They'll throw you out onto the pitch, concussion and all, no bother. But I wasn't well, and I didn't play that Friday. And that Friday, I knew my career was over, even though I went on to play for two more years. I knew my career was over. I knew my mental health, once again, was controlling my life. So two years later, I ultimately retired. I said it was a physical injury. It was a mental injury. It was severe anxiety problems and depression. I never told a coach. I never told a doctor. I never told anyone in the team. And I lived with it silently, consistently throughout my professional career, and it ruined it. Uh, I did the most logical thing most professional rugby players do when they retire. I moved into music. And <laughs> it is actually happening. Robbie Henshaw is a musician. Damien Varley just retired. He's a musician. I'm telling you, I lit the way. <laughs> and the band was grand because I was in, in a band with my mates, and he, they kind of knew I was wired differently. And they kind of, with being in a band environment, you're able to hide. You're able to kind of be away from everything. You don't have to throw yourself in a pit. You have to get in front of thousands of people and play live. And I find that simple, easy. This stuff, I find this easy. If I miss a phone call, I'm having a panic attack. Where's the logic in that? So I went on anyway. The band did all right. We did relatively well in this country. Uh, but once again, I made that connection. I started eating crap. I started drinking a lot more alcohol than I was capable of drinking. And I started getting low. Low, 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 because I was putting crap into my body constantly. And this went on. I did, no, I wouldn't say I, I lived the lifestyle, but I wasn't particularly good to my body. I stopped training. I stopped doing the things that my body liked. And it started rebelling against me. And the band took a break, and I moved to London. And the funny thing about London is, we all have this ridiculous perception, because of Notting Hill and Love Actually, that this Richard E. Curtis London, I'd love to move to London, it seems so amazing. Try live under the Heathrow flight path in Ealing. That's not nice. Like, so, whatever perception you have in London, it's grand going over there for a couple of days and going to the West End and, and whatever, and going around Soho. Living there is a different matter altogether, unless, especially unless you're completely, absolutely minted. Then you might enjoy it. But London was tough for me. It's an every man for himself place. It's Darwinism, survival of the fittest. I remember getting onto the tube and people like, like, little fucking women that size coming and just yanking me out of the way. And I was like, what is going on here? This is crazy. So I ended up starting to become a person I didn't want to become because I started getting on the tube and just whoop, throwing people out of the way. And I'm like, I'm becoming a horrible bastard. And 
I was there a couple of years, and I had what I can only define as my, my one and only breakdown. And everybody always says, I'm having a breakdown, you know, if they burn their dinner. And I'm having a tough day, I'm having a breakdown. In other words, we throw around as if it means nothing. But it means something. I had a particularly acute attack where I was walking down the street in London, and it was a beautiful sunny day. And it was as if somebody just got the dimmer lights and switched them off. Um, everything went black. I couldn't, I wanted, my whole skin felt itchy. And I knew I was in trouble. And I, I know this sounds a bit mad and a little illogical, and some people mightn't compre comprehend what I'm saying here, but I, I walked up to a park in my local area, and I lived in that park for two or three days because I couldn't face anyone. I couldn't face going back to my apartment. My head was full of madness. And I knew I was in trouble. And the problem with a breakdown is you feel that that's the way your life is going to be for the rest of your life, and it's frightening, it's terrifying. And two days later, when I came back, I got a phone call asking me would I like to be a coach on The Voice of Ireland. I went, I'm not doing that shite. <laughs> I signed the contract three days later. <laughs> because in my head, once again, the next thing around the corner is what makes everything better. And think about this for a sec. If you had a physical issue, like you broke your arm, or God forbid you had, you had cancer, do you think by going somewhere else or doing something different that it will go away? Of course it won't. And neither will mental health. It will follow you everywhere you go. Your mental health illness will follow you everywhere until you turn around and face it and go, right, I'm going to have a little word with you and we're going to see what we can do. But when I took on the voice, I thought it was a new change. I was flying home every weekend getting to see my family, which was great. But I realized very quickly I was in trouble um, because all I could think about was the live show. When it comes to the live show, I said, I am going to have a panic attack on live television. I am going to have a panic attack on live television. And I kept saying that. And of course, when you keep saying it, that's exactly what's going to happen. And I built it up. And I thought to myself, if I do have a panic attack on live television, the first reaction of the Irish people, in general, as a society, not as individuals, but as a society, will be either, he is crazy, or he has taken something. That's what we would have, you know, people at home going, what? And my God, why is he on the floor shaking? Why is he choking? Why is there foam coming out of his mouth? And I mean, that's like, it's hard enough sitting beside Keen Egan, but having an <laughs> idea that you're going to have a panic attack. And I built it up. And the third live show of The Voice in the first season, our stage manager knocked on my door. And this is where this story changes. And it was quarter past six, and she said, might side the stage, five minutes. Behind the door, as she was knocking, my legs had failed me. I was choking, I was vomiting, I could barely hear, my ears were ringing, my shirt was ripped. I was on the floor having, to this day, the most profound panic attack I've ever had. I could not breathe, and usually with a panic attack, it lasts for 20, 30 seconds. This felt like it lasted for 20 minutes. I could not catch my breath. I was pulling, pulling at my shirt to try and anchor myself to get a breath and I stood up and looked in the mirror just as I started regaining some composure and just something that you all probably are aware of but men wear makeup and television we have to apparently for the shine <laughs> and I looked up and looked in the mirror and I looked like a burnt welly like a girl who got dumped at the Debs <laughs> there was makeup all over the place and I said to my I have to go on live television in front of 700,000 people. RT liked to tell you it was a million, but it was only 700,000. <laughs> and I have, to, I have to pretend that I'm okay. And I have never had to dig deeper in my entire life than I did in that five minutes. And anyone in this room's had a panic attack realized it can take weeks to get over when I had five minutes. And I stood up, and I'm not religious, I'm not hugely spiritual, but I started praying to my grandfather, who I was very close to, and I just said, I kept saying these words, if you get me through the next 90 minutes, I will take control back of my life. I promise you I will take control back, and I will change my life. And I kept promising myself that. So whatever way I got through the next 90 minutes, I do not know how I did it. I genuinely don't to this day. I did it with a few coping strategies that I had been taught through the years, and I just got through it. And I walked straight off the TV and straight back to my hotel, and I, I, I was shaking. 
And I rang home and I said, this cannot take another career from me. It can't do it again. And I don't know if my parents meant to say this, but they said something about me being unbelievably competitive, just scarily competitive, which I am. They used to say I used to push grannies out of the way going, going up for communion and mass. That's how bad I was. <laughs> just ye- this, I just had to get there first. Body of Christ. And, you know, I, just, I, was very, I was a very good Catholic boy. But that night, I changed my life. And this is where it starts. This is where I decided I was going to take it back. For so long, it didn't belong to me. And did something silly. Silly maybe to you, but completely rational to me. I gave my depression and anxiety a name. I gave it the worst name I could think of that I absolutely hate. And I'm really sorry if I, if I offend anyone in this room. It's Jeffrey with a J. I don't like the name. I was doing a talk recently before the Irish English rugby match and half of it was English. And I said this exact story and I just realized Paddy is pretty much like Jeffrey to, to, the, to the English. So the whole room were like, oh God, I was very, very offended. So anyway, I decided to objectify and humanize what was controlling my life. And I decided to figure out what Jeffrey loved and what he absolutely hated and completely limit what he hated and embrace what he loved. This is my initial relationship with food. I started realizing certain types of food had a really negative impact on Jeffrey and really brought him down and destroyed him. And certain foods had the opposite. Certain foods had this ability to keep me focused, to keep the stress. And at the end of the day, stress is a hormone that goes through your body. And there's things you can eat to kind of neutralize it and kind of keep it a little bit at bay. So I bought a book called Eat Yourself Calm. And I literally read every page to the T of what foods I should be eating, what foods I shouldn't be eating. And this wasn't about dieting. This was about a lifestyle choice, changing my life. I don't diet. I don't, I don't want to. I wanted to change my life. So I took this book on and I realized the foods that I had to take out of my completely take out of my diet and to this day I don't eat any of them and some of them are actually quite healthy foods they're just not particularly good for me so that was the first thing I started doing I then started doing what is known as cognitive behavioral therapy and a lot of you might know what that is but every person in this country would benefit from it we have a weird perception of what counseling means in this country for much in feckin American Oprah Winfrey and all that stuff because they have this kind of skewed, overdramatic vision of what counselling is. Counselling's for everybody, with or without a mental health issue. We can all be mentally stronger. We can all deal with trauma and grief and other issues much better than we actually do, because we've never been taught coping strategies, not in school, not in the workplace, and it's a disgrace. But we can be all mentally stronger. So CBT teaches you how to be mentally stronger. It's available everywhere, and I would strongly advise, if you wanted to get mentally stronger and have that resilience, that you all want, you should look into CBT because ultimately it really gave me a clear way of changing my life. So I I started implementing a few plans then. My next plan was I was having a panic attack every night at two o'clock, two or three o'clock, I'd wake up, night terrors they're called, and I'd have a sore throat, within five minutes I'd be on the floor choking. And I started doing the maths. I started going, I have all this adrenaline going off in my body. In the middle of the night when I don't need it, it's the fight or flight syndrome. We all have it. We're all born with it. Some, some people's are a little bit more skewed, like mine. And my body believed I was about to fight. So it excreted all this adrenaline when I was in bed. And I'd wake up with adrenaline going through my throat. And before I knew it, I wouldn't know what to do with it. My brain would tell me I'm going to panic. And I'd be on the floor having a panic attack. So I went, Jeffrey, I'm going to put a pair of runners beside my bed. And I'm going to go to bed in a pair of sh- uh, runners. I run, I run in shorts and run in top. And I call this the Forrest Gump technique. I would wake up at two in the morning with a sore throat. And before I had a chance to let it develop, I would put on the runners and I would run. And I would run and I would run. And I would run till that pain went away. First night I ran two or three kilometers. Second night, four, five, six kilometers till it went away. I did that every night for 14 nights. And I ran 39 kilometers two weeks later in the middle of the night. So my neighbors, who already thought I was wired differently, (laughs) saw me running like a gazelle 
through the streets at three or four in the morning, completely not knowing why I was doing it. After 14 days, obviously unbelievably fatigued because I'd ran just a marathon the night before, I went to bed and something strange happened. I woke up the next morning at 8 a.m. I have not slept a full night in my life since I was 15. That was the first night since I was 15 that I have slept a full night. And I felt alive. Every part of my body felt amazing. But more importantly, I realized I was taking control back. I was doing things rather than running away from it. And to this day, you're talking about a guy who was probably having a panic attack maybe once a day. I have not had a panic attack at night since that night. Whatever I did to my brain, I told Jeffrey that it wasn't going to be this way anymore. So that was my first kind of experiment with my mental health. I looked at food. I looked at alcohol. All these things that weren't good for me. Not because I was worried about weight. It had nothing to do with that. I was worried about my head. That's all that mattered. Because if your head's not in the right place, everything else falls to shit. Fact, excuse my language, but that's the fact. We invest so much in our physical and our, we, like, we spend more money in gym memberships, more money in our cars, more money having a couple of coffees than we do on our minds. It makes no sense. Let's call a spade a spade here. We don't, as a country, invest anything in this little piece of meat between our ears. And it's ridiculous. So that was my first experiment. My second one was I have a phobia. Not anymore, but I had a phobia that crippled me. And my phobia was of water. I used to punch my mother when she put me in a bath. Genuinely, I used to, no, no, not now, I was a kid like when I punched her, like for fuck's sake. <laughs> Jesus, you must be thinking my poor mother had it tough. I was four. She was well, she was grand and she, she was well able to feck and put me in my place. But I had this deep, deep, horrible, innate fear of water. So I did the most logical thing somebody with this crippling phobia should do and I signed up to an open water sea swim where you swim two kilometers out to sea and you swim back to the middle of the, you know, right out. And as I was signing up for it, my hands were shaking going, this isn't going to happen. But what happens with somebody who goes through what, what I go through and someone who deals with mental health issues, you have an internal resilience far superior to anybody else. And the key is to try and find out how to get that out. How do you get that resilience out? And once you get that out, you become frightening. You become so driven and ambitious and motivated that you can take on anything. And that's a fact. So I truly believe people who deal with mental health distress and illness have an edge over others once they define how to use it. And it takes time. And the only way you can actually find out to use it is that everybody around you is aware of what it is you go through. Because if you're ignoring it or you're silent or you're disguising it, it will eat you. But if everybody around supports you, you can do very, very powerful things. So the next thing I did was I started to learn to swim. And my swimming coach, till, still to this day, Westwood and Clontarf, Carol, still to this day said that I always had my head away from the water when she came in. I couldn't put my head into the water in the swimming pool. I was able to stand up in the deep end, which was great. But I wasn't able to put my head in the water. And she goes, this is going to be tough. Your, your, open water, your first open water swims in eight weeks. So I learned to swim, and I got up every morning, and I just kept going back to that motivation and what was motivating me to do this. And what was motivating me to do this was I wanted to believe that I had a relative control over my mind. And if I proved this particular phobia, my life would open up to all sorts of things. So after two months, I was standing at High Rock in Malahide to start my first open water sea swim. And I was like this. I couldn't breathe, but I kept going back to that internal resilience. And I kept going, I can do it, closing my eyes, until some becker came up to me and said, Brezzy, the seals are mating at the moment in Dublin Bay. <laughs> and they're getting confused with the swimmers in wetsuits. <laughs> so he said, if they come near you, just slap their tail. So in my head, this phobia that took my brain over was replaced by something slightly more scary, <laughs> having sex with a seal. So I got into the water. I'm pretty sure I broke the Olympic record for open water sea swims, <laughs> having only swam for eight weeks. I got out of the water, and I looked him in the eye and went, I didn't see any seals. He goes, Prezi, there are no seals. 
He simply replaced my fear. And once again, I realized, wow, your mind is such a funny thing if you learn how to use it. But that night was the first time in my life, genuinely, where I had true compassion for myself, where I, I, I nearly physically slapped myself in the back and went, well done. You're going somewhere now. And I started defining everything I did from that day on. From the day I had that panic attack on the voice, I decided to take control back of my life. And this increased, and I started doing things I never would have done until this happened. I started signing up for Ironman triathlons, running marathons, stuff that I just had no interest in doing, but I realized the effect this was having on my brain and my mind. And if I can say this without being overly dramatic, I felt happy. And I don't mean that in a cheesy way, because for the, the frustration that I was dealing with all my life, I, I rarely felt happy. No matter what happened, I could not feel happiness, and it was not a nice place to be. But now I was starting to feel it, because Jeffrey and me were getting closer to each other. He's my biggest enemy, but he's my closest friend. And that's the way I looked at him. And the one thing <coughs> that this progressed, and this progressed, and the reason I, I'm telling you this story is, the word motivation and resilience, you have to get a deeper understanding of what that is. You all have personal goals. I don't know what they are, and they're not my business. But you all have personal goals. Probably wouldn't be here otherwise. And you've all, a lot of you have done incredible work already. And I know for a fact you just didn't do it off motivation alone. You went deeper. You went so much deeper into your psyche of why you were going to do this. I'll give you an example. Someone I know close to me, she said she wanted to lose weight. And I said, well, that's, what, that's not a motivation. That's, your, that's, that's, a, that's a, like you're doing something. It's an action. But why do you want to lose weight? She goes, oh, I don't know. I said, well, you won't, you, your chances of achieving this goal, because you haven't defined what your motivation is, is a lot slimmer than it would have been if you actually have a really powerful motivation. So I started talking to her a little bit, and she goes, oh, I go to the gym, and my, I have a personal trainer, and he's always telling me to eat this and eat that, and he's always roaring at me, and I'm like, has he ever asked you, ever asked you about you, about you as a human, about what drives you, about stuff that you potentially have gone through, and stuff that might have may have a reason why you, you can't keep to a diet. Maybe you, have, you find it more difficult than others are changing your lifestyle because something may have happened in the past that makes that a little bit more difficult. Maybe you're not getting the support at home that you deserve. And that's how to define motivation. You've got to get into the human, not into the fact that this person is a commodity and I want to get them, get them to uh, achieve the results. My job's done. It's not. Your job is to develop them as humans, people as humans, as well as what they want with their goals. So what I'm trying to say with this particular person, what it turned out to, to be is, I said to her, who's the biggest love of your life? And she goes, my, my, my child. She had a four-year-old child. And everything was irrelevant apart from this child. And she, at this time, she had put on quite a lot of weight. She wasn't happy. Um, and I said to her, here's your motivation. Do you want your four-year-old, when he's 20, to have a mother with issues, with obesity problems, with maybe joint problems? Do you want that? And the minute I turned it into that motivation, everything changed. And her life changed. And it was the simplest thing. And it wasn't like I had to get any deeper than that. I just had to pick the one thing in life that drove her, drove her and defined her entire life and used that as her motivation. She lost seven stone. She looks incredible, but more importantly, she feels incredible mentally. Everything about her, her self-esteem, her body language, her professional life, her lifestyle has changed. She did not go on a diet. Her lifestyle changed. She changed everything, and she realized after four weeks what it was doing to her mental health. So I'm going to give you the one word of advice with this, you've got to get so deep into what motivates you. Because if you're working and you have to get up at 5 a.m. to do your training or go for a run in the middle of winter, what is the one thing that will pull you out of the bed? What's the one thing that will go right? There's no question in that. Mine is that this is my medication. Without it, I don't feel good. I don't function. So my, my motivation is if I want to feel good and happy, I have to do this. The alternative's never worth it. So what I'm trying to say to you is to find that motivation. Find it. Get deeper than you've ever gone before to find it.
and you put it on a page, and whenever you doubt yourself, you've got to look at what motivates you. Because willpower is a side effect of motivation. Willpower isn't in itself or isn't something you have. Willpower is defined by the motivation you have to achieve what you want to do. So people saying, oh, I don't have great willpower, that's bullshit. Willpower isn't something you have or don't have or have more of. It's the motivation that defines how powerful your willpower becomes. So if anyone tells you, I don't have good willpower, it's just not defining their motivation. I'm going to leave you with four tips to improve your mental fitness that will help you do what you're doing and achieve your goals. And you might think I'm being a little bit out there with this, but I ask you to do this for 10 days. That's it. 10 days, it'll take you no more than 5 to 10 minutes a day for 10 days. Is there anyone in this room who can't invest 10 minutes, 10 days? If there is, you've got a very busy lifestyle and you're probably the very people who should be doing what I'm about to say. But can I just quickly get a hands of anyone in this room who's actively, actively invested in their mind? Just look around. There's about, I'd say, 5%. And you invest in everything else. So it's time to start investing in your mind. And it will give you back a million times more. It's not this infinite source that will always be there. You will experience trauma. You'll experience grief. You'll go through tough times. And if you do not have the coping strategies to deal with that, it will eat you alive. So you've got to learn them because no one's going to hand them to you. We should have been taught them in school, but we weren't. We were being taught how to do quadratic equations and oxbow lakes. We weren't taught about how to be humans. So it's now time for you to do it because no one else is going to do it for you. Here's your four tips, and I'm going to leave you at that. First, completely and utterly limit yourself from toxic environments. People who bitch. People who sit in a room and just go at people and just tear them apart without knowing anything about them just to absolutely deconstruct their character and rip them apart. That's toxic behavior. And scientifically, that is bad. That makes you feel bad. It releases cortisol in your body. It makes you stressful. It makes you feel nauseated. So get away from toxic environments. If you have friends that are always, always at you, are always bitching, just tell them I can't be around you. Because it's not an environment for, it's not an environment for recovery, that's not healthy. The second one, have a little bit of compassion for yourselves. Self-compassion is key. We're so hard on each other. We're so hard on ourselves, we rarely take a moment to congratulate ourselves, to actually tap ourselves in the back and go, well done. Every evening over the next 10 days, try and do one thing that when you go to bed that you can tap yourself in the back. It could be making toast for your mother. It could be saving someone's life. It doesn't have to be profound. You just got to tip yourself in the back and go, well done, that was a nice thing to do. That releases the hormone in your body that makes you feel good. The third one, stop judging people. Just unnecessarily judging people that you know nothing about. Because what that does, have you ever judged somebody and felt good about it? No, you haven't. You can judge people like Katie Hopkins, by all means, because she's not a nice person. And she's a horrible person. Judge that. Don't judge some girl that you know nothing about and know nothing about what she's gone through. Just don't do it, because it's not good for your head. I'll give you an example. Celebrity Big Brother. That's exactly how humans shouldn't be. That's exactly how humans shouldn't interact. And it makes me ask myself, TV producers exploiting emotionally vulnerable people who weren't well, they're not well, and exploiting them. And I thought to myself watching it, if one of those guys had a physical issue, would that producer exploit that? No, they wouldn't because they'd be pulled from their offices and fired but it's okay to exploit people's emotional vulnerabilities. And we love it. And we watch it. And we go, oh my God, they're arseholes. I love this show. And it's not good for your head. It's just toxic judgment. And it's not something I would advocate to watch. Watch Bear Grylls. That's good for your head. Because it's nature and stuff. The fourth thing is gratitude. We're always going on about what we don't have. We rarely step back and realize what we actually do have. And we are spoiled rotten in this country in a good way. We have access to so many great things. So every morning when you wake up over the next 10 days, I want you to do 30 thank yous. Stupid things. It can be, as I said, toast, toothpaste, the roof over your head. 30 thank yous. Before you wake up and your feet hit the floor, get those thank yous. Because that basically tells your brain that that's the type of day you're going to have. It's going to be a thankful day full of gratitude. It's going to be positive. Because you could wake up in a desert island with a beautiful, you know, sea and sand in front of you and you could stand in a bucket of shit. 
you define how your day starts. So when you wake up and it's raining outside, don't go, oh my God, go 30 thank yous. The difference that makes is immense in your day. So first, limit yourself from toxic people. Second, have some compassion for yourselves. Third, stop judging others. Fourth, have some gratitude. And the last thing I'm going to leave you with, you all have smartphones, I'm guessing. Some of you may not, um, and that's okay too, but you won't be able to do what I'm about to say. <laughs> Download something called Headspace. I am not an advocate. I get no benefit from this. I don't know the guy who runs it. It simply has changed my life. It's a nap that you listen to 10 minutes, 10 times uh, for 10 days. It's called Take 10. It's a big white background with a big orange dot. It looks like a gone off Korean flag. That's just in case, because there's a few headspace. Download that onto your phone. Start that tonight. And watch what that does. Giving your mind that little bit back. It's the single greatest app that should be on everybody's phone in this world that moves at five million miles an hour. You need to be able to stop. And that's what headspace does. It gives you some headspace. That's the fifth thing I'm going to leave you with. Uh, I think we're going to do a quick Q&A uh, with any particular questions. I know I'm after waffling on a lot, but you for sure me, have. the one thing you want to get out of this, define your motivation. <laughs> Fantastic. Brilliant. Thank you. Fantastic, Brezzy. Thanks a million for that. I think you might be the first thank you we have later on when we're going to bed. We can say thank you for Brezzy's, <laughs> Brezzy's chat. Um, but just actually picking up on what you said there, I've only recently, well, again, I'll go back the last four years, I've, uh, I've decided to live my life by one kind of mantra, which is a Sinead O'Connor album title. I do not want what I have not got. So I don't, anything that I kind of, I don't have, I don't look at it and go, I want that, I want to live there. I'm happy where I am, I'm happy where things are. And it's, it is a great way to feel, it really is. Yeah, I think, I think, to be fair in Ireland, like once again, we, we got so bombarded with economics. Uh, yeah. We started becoming, a, like no one ever liked Ireland because we were rich. Yeah. That's not why people like us. They liked us because of our culture, our personalities. And I think we threw it away. Yeah, we did. And I think we're slowly getting it back. But as you said, in that culture, part of the culture, your status was defined about how much money you had, or your family might have, or what you have. What you um, drove, where you went on holidays. You know, and at, at the end of the day, it's, all that stuff is relatively relevant. Yeah. Uh, it really is. And I don't mean that in a kind of hippie way. I mean that in a normal human way. We might take, is there any questions from the floor here? Anyone um, got any questions? We've a lady with her hand up there. Will we get a mic to her? Do you want to stand up there to, please? Hi, how are you? Hi. Uh, how are you? I was wondering if you think that you have a child who's kind of wired differently, as you were saying yourself, um, like you probably didn't say it to your mom or dad, like, you know, I feel like this and everything. How would you kind of, what, what would you do? Well, uh, I actually did. I had an incredible oh. mother. Um, I wasn't incredibly open about my, what I was going through. I tried to hide it as much as I could because I was able to because I was achieving. So I was, she kind of knew, she was aware of it. But the thing about it is, and it, I mean this, what my, my mission and other, like Conor Cusick's missions in this country, we're not here, we're not psychologists, we can't tell you what to do. Our mission is to destroy the stigma. And that stigma that makes it hard for your son or daughter to come forward and tell you because they're gonna be judged, they're gonna be perceived as weak are perceived as even dangerous, as some media have decided to run with this last couple of months. Um, and the fact is, until that stigma is crippled and destroyed, and, and the people who have the power to do that isn't the government. We can talk about the government and investing and all this. It's, the, it's society and media that have the power to, to destroy that. And I think un, until we stop, I, I did a talk in this very room last night to, to third and fourth years, and I said, hands up who thinks the stereotype of somebody with depression, somebody who sits in the corner, is quiet, doesn't talk a lot, it's a bit geeky. They were like, every one of them put their hands up. And the fact is, it's just so not true. The most powerful, creative, incredible people I have met genuinely throughout my life are people who deal with mental health issues. And for that daughter or son, whoever it is, I don't even know if it's, it's personal, but whoever it is, hopefully in the next year or two, if we start getting our job done and the media start really engaging with us, it, they won't have a problem uh, should, coming forward. Sh should a parent um, maybe mention it to uh, you know, a teen that they suspect, or should they not say anything? Abs what? No, absolutely. Be frank. Be up unbelievably frank. Like I've 
in cases, especially if you're really worried. And I mean, I've dealt with this a lot with other people and especially teenagers who potentially might be suicidal. And I said to the parents, ask them, ask them straight out, are you suicidal? And they'll either go, no, or they go, actually, I'm not well. And but the fact is, often you said it, or often you said, listen, are, are, you, are you okay? They know it's on the agenda now. They know that if they do finally go, you know, I better go and say something. Ignoring it and pretending it doesn't exist is not the answer. I, as I said, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist. But it doesn't make any sense or logic to ignore it. And the idea that someone knows that you're there and you can comfort them is enough, sometimes. But if it's a more serious issue, you have to be frank. You have to be straight up with them and go, where are we at here? How bad is it? Some of them will tell you. And I think the other issue we have, I'm sorry because I'm burning the ear off you again, is our education system. Mm. You know, how many hours do, do our kids spend in schools? We spend 14 years educating them and then expect them to, prof to, to show their academic worth over a 12-day period. We shove fiction down their throat and sell it as fact. We make the Kardashians relevant. We make people like that relevant. We set ridiculous standards for our teenagers. Yet our schools give them no coping strategies or mechanisms. And the fact is, my life could have been a hell of a lot easier if I had learned those as a 15-year-old. But I was in a Christian brother school, and I can tell you they weren't talking about depression in there. We suppose we, that then has to come then from home. If we're not getting it, you know, our teenagers are not getting it in school, then it has to, parents, I, and I am one of it, an eight-year-old, I have to learn how to teach those coping skills. The fact skills. is, it's simple as this, and this is, where, this is where politics cannot come into it because it can slow things down. The fact is, our education system has a complete 100% responsibility to do this. And I think the teachers want to do this. They absolutely want to do this. There's teachers walking into schools around Ireland every day trying to pick up the pieces of some young girl who took her own life in a classroom. Yeah. And they're not trained in this. They're not trained in school. And it's not put, there's some schools doing amazing work, but at a strategic level, our education system has to completely change to tailor for human development because it's, at this point, if it wasn't so serious, it's actually humorous. Go it's, to Finland. It's not See how they do all. it. We take, is any more, any more questions? We have a few here. Is a lady up the front here. Can we get a mic to this lady? Second row, run, uni slim team. <laughs> Great. I think there's a mic there. Brilliant. Now, do you want to stand up? And we, but this is probably going to have to be our last question, unfortunately, Rosie. Yeah, it will be quick. I just want to say I've got a daughter now who's just gone to England. She's 26. But Sorry, you, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to hear. I don't know if anyone else in the room can Sorry. hear the question. Can you hear me now? That's perfect. Thank you. I have a 26-year-old daughter who suffered with depression since she was 12 okay. in this country. And I find the worst thing is people in the community, not parents or professionals who tried to help, but people in the community that judge pass judgment continually and they don't know nothing about it and she's actually moved from Ireland because of other people's attitude and I just find that the worst thing that you have to deal with and I think maybe if people could go into churches where a majority of people do attend mass and then come out and judge other people mm. maybe if talks were done in there that would open eyes to people and then a young person dies in the community and they say, oh, I wonder why it happened. But if they actually looked into it, mm. they may be able to see why it's happened because of the people's attitude towards them. I, there's no doubt in my mind. Yeah, that that's it. Uh, I think, if I'm being honest, I think Irish society is definitely changing for the better. I made this uh, kind of analogy that for years, it seems like we pull back this big elastic band and let the tension build up around this subject and build up and ignored it and ignored it and ignored it. Not very long ago, suicide was a cardinal sin in this country. Not very long ago, we were just throwing people into institutions with no care. Not, and I'm genuinely not long ago. Now we've got some brilliant places like St. Pat's. We've got places like St. John of God's that genuinely are doing fantastic work. Are they getting the support and resources they deserve? Probably not. But what's happened now is the elastic band's been released and people are finally looking to seek help, but they're not getting it. And that's frightening. And the, f the fact is, the most important relationship between someone with mental health issues is peer-to-peer. -peer. They need peer-to-peer -peer support. They, you know, it's great counseling. Psychologists are fantastic. They can really lead to recovery. But unless you have peer-to-peer -peer support, it's proven that it doesn't have, it has a much more profound positive impact on people's mental health. So for me, to create a society, to change an attitude, in a country, especially a country like Ireland, and I don't mean that in a negative way, because Ireland, in general, is quite a conservative place. 
but to change an attitude is virtually impossible, and that's what we're trying to do. And the fact is, I'll give you an example. I thought we were getting somewhere. I genuinely was like, I was really kind of quite positive about certain things, and then that devastating plane crash, mm -hmm. and I saw the media and how the media portrayed depression and how they threw depression into this big bowl that everybody in depression, everyone with depression, this is how it reacts. The fact was that person was evil. They didn't mention maybe he was severely narcissistic, also probably dealing with serious psychosis, which is another matter altogether. No, he was just depressed. That's all we got. So basically that headline wrote off 30% of our population as dangerous. And the Daily Mail in the UK, I wrote to them, and I wrote them a letter, and I said, do you have any idea how crippling what you said in your absolute terrible headline, how damaging that is to kids who maybe haven't spoken, to their friends who haven't spoken, to the mothers and fathers, and they went, absolutely, it was a complete mistake. I said, but are you gonna say that in your paper? They went, no, and they didn't. And that's the problem. We are so easily able to blame depression on everything. If that was a mechanical failure that caused that plane crash, we would have had to go through 50, 60, 70 different tests before the proof was actually definitely said it was this particular issue. But literally the day after they were able to go, he crashed the plane because he was depressed, not knowing how many years that can set us back. But the fact is, I, that's difficult for you and your daughter, but I can guarantee it in five or six years, if the media keep engaging with, with people that are willing to get up and work, I'm willing to do anything. It's become my major mission in life. But if the media will engage with us, and get on back with us, we can actually become moral leaders at this because we're a lovely little sized country and we're a tribal country that get behind things. But the change in attitude is difficult. And every time I think we're getting somewhere, something like that happens and it's a bit of a kick in the arse. Brilliant. Unfortunately, Bresley, we're gonna have to say goodbye to you now. A huge thank you for everyone from our audience, from UniSlim. Thanks a million, Bresley.